like I said, we've covered the basic data types. Um, now we're going to start looking at how we can do some programmatic things, programming in R. Um, and we're going to start by just looking at some very simple concepts of conditionals, branching, making decisions in R based on the data, doing something different in one situation and doing something else in another. And also how we can do loops, uh, how we can iterate through files, iterate through our data, apply a complex operation, and then output the results. Okay. So we've already looked at logical vectors. So we've already some way had these kind of decisions made for us. Um, and we actually looked at logical vectors as a way of indexing or replacing information in other vectors. So here we had our x is um, 1 to 10. We used x is less than 4, and this created a logical vector, which allowed us then to subset our x to just our first three. So logical vectors, we've already come across and certainly logical values, true, false. We've seen now in R already. These logicals which are allowing us or will allow us to um, perform some of these complex scripted procedures. So here I think we're going to cover conditions and loops. So while I'm analyzing data, iterating over something, um, if I need to do something, this is an important if statement. If I need to do this, I will use R, else I will do something. I will use a calculator. Okay, so these if and else are actually uh, fundamental in our conditional branching and language, but also in R. And we can see how they work here. So this conditional branching, this is the evaluation of a logical, is it true, is it false, to determine whether a chunk of code should be executed. Okay. So in R, we can use this if statement we put the logical to be evaluated between these brackets just after the if statement. So we have if, and then we put our logical value here. And anything we want to run, should this be true, we put in these curly brackets after the um, if statement. Okay, so it needs to be set up exactly like this. If, and then you have your um, parentheses, and you put in here your logical value or something which will result in a logical value and then what you want to evaluate what you actually want to run should this be true within this section here within this curly bracket so in this case we can do this very simply i'll set x to be a logical itself so i will set x to be true and then it goes if and then it evaluates it is true okay just set it above and then it's going to print the message which it does x is true i'm not sure if we've come across message um, in R, but if you want to ever print to the screen and let yourself know how you're doing in a loop, you can use message. In this case, then we're going to set X to be false. So we'll just change the Boolean that the Boolean yeah, to false, logical to false. And now, if we know this is false, it's not going to evaluate this um, bit of code. And it will skip past it and we don't get any message at all. Okay? So when this is true, we will evaluate what's in this after this curly bracket to the next curly bracket. If this is false, this whole chunk will just get mixed, missed. Most of the time, we're not gonna set it up like this where we have our true upfront in a value. We're not gonna put in false and true ourselves. We're gonna use um, a condition to actually produce this true or false for us. So we can see a really nice, easy example of this here. We're going to have x is 10, y is 4. I'm going to go if, and it's the same setup. I have our if, I have our brackets, and I put my what will evaluate to a logical here. And I have my bit of code here, which I want to run should this end up being true. And what happens if we go if, this gets evaluated, x in this case is greater than y. Therefore, it goes in here and it evaluates this bit of code. And we'll get the value of x is 10, which is greater than 4. That's just printing this message. And then go and change y now to be 20. x is no longer greater than y. Then I'm not going to get this message. Okay, This is then evaluating to be false. And I don't get that message. Probably still want it to do something if, um, in the other case, you know, if x is greater than y, maybe I want to say 
or, uh, or x isn't greater than y, I want to say something else. So I can add another step to my conditional and I can follow my if statement. So I have my if, my, my actual uh, execution block here, and then straight after the, the curly brackets closing that first block, I put my else and I open another block of curly brackets here. And I put the bit of code which I want to evaluate here, should this not be true. Okay, so it's going to evaluate this. If x is less than five, it will come and evaluate this first chunk. If it's not, it's going to go in here and evaluate the second chunk. So we can see this in action again. We just set x to be three. And we go if x is less than five, x is three, so it is less than five, should print this message. And that's exactly what it does. X is less than uh, less than two five, I think. Less than five. We can then change this, add in the x is 10. So now this would not fit this first condition, right? X is no longer less than five. But because we've added the else statement, it still does something. It evaluates this as false. And it will come to the else statement and it will print that instead. So then we can start to make this more complex, um, build up uh, our operations and our conditions here by adding in a new feature, which is else followed by an additional if. So this allows us to check multiple conditions. And finally, we can end it in an else statement to capture any, any other uh, conditions which weren't covered here. So in this case, I have my x is five. I'm going to assess if x is greater than five. I'm going to print this message. Else, it's going to check this value, uh, this condition, x equals five. So it's double equals there. Then it will print that message. Should neither of these be true, it will come to the final thing and do else, whatever, message x is less than five. You can make these as complex as you need. Um, there are other ways of doing else and if, but this is quite a nice way of doing this. You can have any, any depth of else if statements afterwards. A really useful function when you're working with vectors, um, not factors, is to uh, apply this if else function. Okay? So this allows you to evaluate a conditional statement over the length of a vector and return a value for each value for each element in that vector. So here I can just create a ve uh, vector 1 to 10. And I have x and I just put 1 to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then I can do if else and I give it my conditional I want it to evaluate x is less than or equal to 3 and it's going to put less or equal if it's true, and it's going to put more if it's false. Okay, so I pass my vector. And you can see it goes through and evaluates every element in my vector. So for the first one, it is less than or equal to three, so it's less or equal. The sec second one is, third one is, and then after that, it's no longer true, so then they all start to become more. We can also nest these just like we did here with this if else you know, else if, sorry. Um, so in this case, if we want to do a nested uh, and capture some other conditions, we can do if else x is three, it's going to print same because the first part is true here. This is what happens if it's true. If it's false, it's then going to go to another conditional and it's going to go x is less than three, put less, if not, put more. Okay, so then for, therefore it's going to assess this first and it's going to find that this is same. And then it's going to go in for every element where it was false, where it wasn't three, it's going to go in and check, well, is it less than three? And it will put less. If it's not, then it will put more. So that's how we can do if else statements. Um, we just need to have our if, we put our conditional we want to evaluate. And then we can do our brackets to tell it, you know, in this situation, you can evaluate like this. If this is the situation, you evaluate like this. If none of these situations are true, finally do this.
But I think logical operations are, are fairly straightforward and oh, we got some good exercises coming up. The next thing we want to do um, often in any programming language is we want to be able to iterate over conditions, over uh, files, over data and apply some function, apply some method to that data as we go along. We have two main generic methods of looping in R um, and they're quite different in their use and one is while and one is for. So while loops, and I think these exist in every programming language, these, these kinds of loops. So while loops repeat the execution of a code while a condition evaluates to be true. So a really good use of while loops is reading a file uh, in chunks. So you keep reading the file and while I still have more file to read, keep reading. And eventually I will get to the end and there will be no longer anything to read. That won't be true and I will just stop. For loops are perhaps what we use more often in R. And this is when we want to loop over a, a, a predefined range of values. And we just want to loop through them and apply the operation to these values or using those values. So we'll start with while loops. Um, Really, you know, a while loop, as you'll see in the exercises, it's important you need to know that the condition will eventually be satisfied. So eventually we want X to be less than, um, sorry, we eventually we want X to be uh, greater than three, otherwise this is never gonna stop. Um, so in this case, we're gonna say X is one, and we're gonna go while, and it's gonna keep evaluating this until it's no longer true while x is less than three it's going to give us the value of x it's going to message x is x and give us the value and then we're going to add one to it right so in the first time we come to this x is one uh, one is less than three it's going to print the message x is one and then it's going to add one to x and replace its value and then it's going to do the loop again so the second time through the loop, it's added this value. So X is now two, two is still less than three. It's gonna print the message and it's gonna do again, add one to the value of X. And then when it comes to the loop the third time, X isn't less than, isn't less than three, it's three. So it skips out of the loop and then we can move out and we can finally print any messages after the loop. For loop um, allows the user to kind of cycle through a range of values, applying an operation for every value uh, in that range of data we're going through. So here, a very simple example, we're just gonna loop through a numeric vector and we're gonna print out the value as we go through the loop. So there's no, in here we had to do the incrementation ourselves. Here, I, is working through this vector from one, two, three, four, five, for i in every value of the vector, I'm going to apply and do this message. Okay, so starting at the beginning, first time through i is one, we get the message one. Second time through it's two, third time through it's three, four, five, and then we finished with our values of x and it will skip past and move on to what, what other, whatever code is following this. Okay. That's a very simple example there. We can also loop through or cycle through um, other vector types or list types, anything which has um, dimensions that we can work through. We could work through the columns of a matrix or the columns of a data frame, the rows of a data frame. So here we're just gonna loop through another vector, but this time it's gonna be a character vector. So I'm gonna take the letters, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this, maybe am I sharing my screen? My screen, desktop. Then our, and it's often used in the examples, you have uh, letters, I think if you just type that in, it gives you all the letters in the alphabet. I think if you do capital letters like this, it gives you all the capital, capital letters in the alphabet. Yeah, move this a bit. Okay, so but it's the same as with a numeric vector. We just have x for i in every value of x, go through them in the order and message what the value of i is here. And we get a, b, 
C, D, E. Do you know why I did two, two upper? I could have just done capital letters. I'm not sure why I did. So a really common practice here, we're actually looping through the value itself, right? So we've taken X and it's four I in every value of X. Here we create a different um, character vector and we loop through every value of that character vector. Quite often um, when you're looping through, you wanna loop through two vectors or the same length at the same time. And so I wanna get the first position of both my vectors compare them, maybe just print them in this case. Then I want to get the second position in both my vectors, then the third position. And that's because the order in these vectors I know to be relevant and I know to be the same. So in this case, I'm going to have um, just some gene expression values. I've got the gene names in one vector. I've got XZF1, MIC, and IGL1. Um, and then I've got the expression for these genes in this vector, a numeric vector here. What I'm going to do is rather than loop through the actual values in either of these vectors, I'm just going to loop through the positions within these vectors. Okay. So to get like a, a value or a, a range that I can loop through, I can just do one to length of the gene name. Right? So I know these are the same length up front, but I can go one to the length of this gene name. Um, so that's going to be three. And that gives me a new vector of one to three. And it's that what I'm going to use to loop through. So I'm going to go for I in this vector I'm creating this one to three. So one, two, three. And now as I go through, I can just use the value one, two or three to extract the first position of either vector. Then I can take the second position of either vector and then the third position of either vector. So this is often something we will do. We don't necessarily want to loop through just the values we just want to loop through many vectors and we want to compare the same position within them as we go across. So here it's going to go through. I is going to be one. It's going to present the first um, gene name. Gene name, I'm indexing it with the I. So it's going to be one here, the XZF1. And then it will look in the expression at the same position, one, and pull out 10.4. And then I can do MIC, 4.3, IGLR1, 6.4. So this is quite common practice for us to do something like this. We don't loop through the values, but we loop through the positions. So loops then, we can start to kind of combine these things together and we can start to do our conditional statements within our loops. So here we're going to go X is 1 to 13. And then we're going to loop to through 1 to 13. I should probably loop through X. Sorry. I lost my slide there. Okay. And then as we go through I 1 to 13, if I is less than 10, we'll do one thing. Else, if I is 10, we'll do something else. Um, else, we will do this third thing. Okay. So for every value, it's going to loop through 1 to 13. Um, and then as it starts, the value will be 1. Let's get that slide a bit. So the first time through, the value will be 1. What one is not greater than 10, one is not equal to 10, one is less than 10. So it's going to satisfy this else statement. Number one is less than 10. And it will continue through two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, until it gets to 10, right? until it's done the loop and it's got to 10. At that point, I will be 10. Right? So it's going to print this message instead. And then we're going to come through after that, neither of these two, sorry, this will be no longer true, but this one will be true. So then we can start printing the first message. So that's just like a toy example to show you that we can combine these loops with our conditionals and we can start to do really complex things. And this is a very, just for printing, um, but you can imagine a loop through files, do this operation, loop through files. If I read this in the first column, do this. So it can be very useful to combine these two. Sometimes you might want to actually leave a loop um, in a similar way that you did with the while. So the while kept on evaluating until it was true and then it left, until it was false and then it left. In this case, um, we can actually add break into somewhere in our loop. And should the code ever come across um, this break, it's actually just going to leave the um, stop running the loop. 
Okay, so this break tells you exit the loop. So in this case, we've put this in the else if i equals 10 condition. So it's going to keep on evaluating this until it gets 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Until this becomes true, i is 10. It's going to print the message, and then it's going to come across this break statement. And then it's just going to exit the loop. So in the previous slide, we didn't have that break statement. And it carried on after 10. When I was 11, it was greater than 10, and it made this message. And that's actually what we saw here. By adding this break, at this point, it exited the loop, and we never got the number 11 is. So this part here is now kind of defunct. OK, so we're almost actually at the end of this session. Um, so these are loops, um, and they're very general loops. So you could apply this for loop and move through any type of data. So where would you, where would you want to have else after this? Um, so in this case, so why would I after the break? Oh, in this case, actually, so in this case, this break is only evaluated. Um, so the else statement, the way I've done this, was actually getting evaluated all these times. So this number one is less than 10. Um, oh, in this case, it wasn't. Oh, I see. I changed that. Yeah, you're right. So in this case, yes, the, el the else became totally defunct, right? Because once we got to this, it wasn't ever going to go and do this with this break. So I was just using this as an example, but you're right here. The else statement is never going to get evaluated because i is less than 10. It's going to print this. Once it gets to 10, it's going to do this break. Right? And it's just going to leave it. So in this case, there is no point having this else here. I was just using it as an example just to show you that you can suddenly lose a loop. Yeah, so you know, I had, yeah, there are situations where we're gonna you're gonna want to use else. I think in this example it wasn't it's the most useful example. This particular break here is just never gonna happen. In the exercises, I think you're gonna need to use a break. Yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question. Um great. So then we have a so we have loops and these allow us for and they just give us this high degree of control. We also have a set of functions which actually allow you to apply apply um, a function to your elements or your rows or columns, parts of vectors in a slightly more readable way, I would say. Okay. And these include these family of functions. They're all called the apply family. But we have this function apply, and this allows us to apply a function to the columns rows or columns of a matrix and data frame and return the results as a vector matrix or list. We have L apply, which was a really nice general one, which is just going to apply a function to every element of a vector or a list and return the results as a list. And then we're going to have S apply, which is our, this is list apply. S apply is actually smart apply. So it's going to apply a function to every element of a, of a vector list and return the results as a vector matrix or list. But it's going to try and return the results in a friendly way to you. So if it feels like a matrix um, is a better solution to return, it's going to try and return a matrix. If it can't return a matrix, it's going to try and return a vector. If it can't return a vector, it will try and return a list. But you'll see this in action and it actually can be very useful. It will fill in some of the gaps for you. So the apply function, like I was saying, it works on um, tabular data. Um, and we can apply a function to the rows or columns of a matrix. We just need to give it this apply function. We give it the data we want to operate on. We tell it the margin, margin we want to operate within. So I can tell it I want to operate on the rows, or I want to operate along the columns. Or you could operate on individual cells. You could say every single cell by giving the margin to be C12, like a combined vector of one, two. We put the function here, which we want to apply. And then any arguments we might want to apply or give that function, we put where this dot, dot, dot is. Okay, so this is the table. This is the rows. We're going to work across rows or columns. This is the actual function we'll apply. 
And this is extra additional arguments we want to give to this function. So this would have been really useful for the exercises yesterday. Um, I'm just learning about it today. So here we have our matrix combined vector one to four, to one to four, um, two rows, two columns by row. So one, two, three, four. And then if I want to apply across the rows and get the mean, I can just go apply, give it my matrix, tell it I want to work on rows. Number one is rows, two is columns, just like you know before the comma, first position is rows, after is columns. And then I'm going to apply the mean function. Mean's a nice easy function, takes really just one argument, the uh, data we want to take a mean of. So here it's going to take the mean of the first row sorry, of the rows, the first row, then the second row. And we can get the mean of the columns, right, by just putting two here, and we'll get two and three. Okay. Actually, I think in the exercises, we, we learned about the cold means uh, function. But this allows you to apply any function to rows, columns, and as we saw, cells of a matrix or a data function. Like, uh, like I was saying, you can supply additional arguments in this dot, dot, dot bit here. So after the comma, any arguments we want to pass to this function, we can still pass to it in this dot, dot, dot. So here we're going to go and um, actually just paste. So we're going to join the character into a character, the rows. So we're going to do through our matrix, our matrix here, go by row, and I want to paste them. But am I still sharing my full screen? I do paste. You can see paste takes some additional arguments. And one of these arguments is step. And it's the separator between how I'm going to paste characters together. Usually it's a space. I want to change that. So I changed it to, uh, oh, it's actually collapse I'm using. I'm sorry. Uh, so collapse is here, uh, string to separate the results. So I'm using collapse. Here I'm going to set collapse to be a semicolon and then it's going to work through the rows it's going to apply paste to that row um, using an additional argument of collapse okay one two three four chat is there a reason to use l apply or s apply i guess the answer is no i i would imagine s apply would come with an over so l apply you can one thing is you can be guaranteed to get a list back from l apply we're going to come to this in a few things, but L apply is always going to give you a list back, right? S apply is going to try and guess. Um, yeah, thanks, Matt. S apply, uh, yeah, I'm saying the same as him, but S apply is going to try and guess um, what would be the best type of data to give you back. So it will, it will say, can I make this into a matrix? It will try and give you that back if it can, then a vector and then a list. So sometimes you definitely want the list back, right? Maybe it would be possible to turn into a matrix, but L apply is going to always give you a list. The other thing I suspect, and I don't have to test it, is anytime R does an additional check, um, that will take time. So it's going to go and check, can I make this into a matrix? Can I make this into a vector? No, then it will give me a list. I guess that's going to take a little bit of time, and you probably wouldn't notice it on simple operations. But if you're writing code to then operate on thousands of files, thousands of times, you're going to start to notice it. But I, I would always try, uh, if you, I would always see how S apply works, unless I absolutely sure I want to list back. Um, great. So apply, we can work on matrices or data frames, things with rows and columns. L apply, we can then work on lists or vectors. Okay, but L apply, is always, like we're just saying, it's always going to return a list. Okay. So here we're going to do L apply, and I'm going to give it um, two values to work through. So I'm taking the mean actually of one value at a time here, which is a bit daft. But L apply um, through one, then two, take the mean, and it gives me back a list, right? We can see this double square brackets means it's a list. And I got two there. Um, as with apply, I can also give it additional arguments here. So here I'm giving it a list and the second uh, um, a list of one. The last argument was two, but here I've got NA and one. And we know the mean will struggle. If it comes across an NA, it's going to 
tell me the result is NA, but I can tell it to remove NAs, right? So I can just supply an additional argument, just like I could have with apply. After the function call, I put a comma. Any additional arguments for the function I put there. Mean, um, if I hop in here. Mean. Uh, has this additional argument NARM equals false. So a logical value value indicating whether NA value should be stripped before the computation proceeds. Yeah, we do. Um, so I can add that additional, and then I will get actually a result for the second one. If I didn't put this NARM in, if it was true, it would give me NA back for the second one. You have another question? All right, cool. So then S apply, smart apply, acts as L apply, but attempts to return the results as the most appropriate data type. Okay, so here S apply returns a vector while L apply will return a list. So here we have our vector, one, two, three, four, five. Our list, one, two, three, four, five. If I give S apply uh, the vector and I say, take the mean, it's gonna give me back a vector. I gave it the list and said, work through every element and give me the mean, it's going to give me back a vector, right? which already is much more useful in giving back a list. I need to unlist and then work on in this particular example. Um, so it gets a little bit even better for this particular example, which is, I think, a nice one. So in this case, I have an example list. I have row values one to five, um, I have row two values six to 10 row three, so 11 to 15. So this just makes a list named row one, row two, row three, and containing five values in each uh, element. If I was to do L apply on this and apply, I want the quantiles of this data, quantile another function that will give me the quantiles. If I apply quantile to my list, it's a nice result. It's gonna give me the quantiles, which is actually here, really easy to work out. Right. But maybe that isn't the best way for me to deal with this. And actually, S apply in this example does something really nice where it's going to um, create a matrix from these results, right? Because these could easily fit into a matrix. They're all the same length. Um, therefore, it puts them in and it gives me columns, which are the rows, and it gives me row names, which were the quantiles, which were chosen. Okay. So S apply will try and turn this into a matrix. If that fails, it will try and turn it into a vector. If that fails, it will just return the list as a result. So there are times when you will know, wait, this is gonna work better in S apply. And this is one example. Oh yeah, just to show it not working on everything. because it's not magic, it can't solve all our problems for us. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna give it a data frame uh, a list with a data frame for the first element, a vector for the second element, and another vector for the third element. And then I'm gonna ask it to give me the summary, right? And summary is gonna give me a different type of result back for a data frame as it would a vector. And we actually use this as an example of um, data frames having slightly nicer methods you can apply to them. Fact is this, this can't be put together into a vector. They're kind of different types of object. This certainly can't be a matrix, so it just returns a list in this case. Okay, so that's the end of our first session. Um, we have some exercises. See, I see we have a message in the chat. I'll come to that now. Um, we have some exercises to go through. These are good exercises, and they're starting to get a little tougher. Um, and especially this one's worth working through yourselves. We have the answers on the next slide, but worth working on this because this is often what you need to do in R. I've got all these files. I need to take a bit of information from them, aggregate them into one table, which I can then pass to my next analysis program. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in here by using a combination of our reading from last session and our loops um, from this session. And then we're going to merge in some annotations. Like so. so it's a really nice exercise. I will come back at um, 2.30 maybe just a little bit before and I'll run through this exercise now. Two questions. One, two, three, four, I'll have a look now. Exactly four. Okay.
Yes. So, yeah, Esha, Esha said that. It's a, it's, a, it's a daft example again, you know, so let's, let's actually take it out into R quickly. Um, you know, I'm just an example so that we don't uh, make it complex. Um, so example vector, we have that. And if we, if we change this to say print, that gives me anything or message maybe. Okay. So you can kind of see what it does is it's working through every element in that vector at a time. Okay, so it's not gonna give you, so we had this before, right? Um, if we wanted to get the whole thing, we wouldn't pass it to S apply. We would just do mean and give it the example vector. And that would give us the mean. What this is actually doing is the equivalent of a loop. It's looping through every element of the example vector and getting the mean, okay? So the first one it goes through, it takes the mean of one, then it takes the mean of two, then it may take the mean of three. Not a great example. Um, if I made a list here, it would probably be better. Uh, list. Is that right? Is that gonna give me a list? Yeah. Not numerical logical. No, there we go. Uh, let me do that again. But effectively, I hope you get the yeah. Okay, Calvin, you got it. Um, it's it's working through every element. It's not working on the whole the whole vector at one time. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, I will be back at two thirty, and we can run through the exercises. I, I will come back just a little bit before two thirty, but maybe 2.35, just so that we have enough time to get into the last part today, which will be function. Okay, thanks a lot for your uh, attendance. I will be back at 2.30. Okay, so I'm just gonna get myself together and I'll run through this exercise. Open up R on the side. Okay. So she has to do the questions. I've already got the answers. Okay. Share screen if any more questions in the chat. Great. Great, Karen. That's great. Um, so clearly, like, I can see you're all going through this. Um, where you can see I'm getting lots of questions, and maybe Matt's getting questions too. Um, it is getting tougher now, these exercises. And actually, to be fair, I think logic and programming, this is about as tough as it gets. Oh, my battery's about to run out. So, um, keep at it. This, this is, if we can get through these exercises at this point, we're good. We really are. Um, we're going to learn more functions and different functions, but it doesn't get much more complex in terms of programming if we need to do some basic high throughput sequencing analysis or even complex high throughput sequencing. So I'm recording, I'm sharing screen. I've got my solutions here. <clears throat> okay, so calculate the factorial uh, of 10 using a loop. Uh, and then I put the factorial, so effectively you just timesing all the numbers up to 10 against each other. Um, there is obviously a function in R called factorial, but I say using a loop. Um, so this is how we can do this. And uh, what do we have to do? Get the using a loop. So effectively, we're just going to go up till 10. So one to 10. We're going to set that we could use I but here I'm using X to be different. Um, and as we go through our loop, we need to calculate the factorial. Issue is actually, we want to just for the first time we go to the loop, we want to do something a little different. Um, and often we will do this trick. Maybe the first time through the loop, we need to set up the data we want to merge together. Um, so in this case, if X equals one, which is the first time we're going through the loop, we set the factorial answer to be one, right? Because it's only going to be one times nothing, yeah. 
else. So as soon as we're past that first loop, right, and you've got else, and remember else we always have open and close brackets. It's easy to forget. Open and close brackets here, um, if and then else. So once we're past that first loop, take the previous answer we've already got, right? So we went through once, we already had factorial answer set there. Now take that and times that by the present loop value, right? Which would be two the second time, three the uh, third time, four, five, six. So we're just going through these values and we're incrementing our factorial as we go. Um, we just need to make sure first time through, we actually set a factorial answer. And okay, so now adjusting your answer from before, um, what is the first number that has a factorial greater than a thousand? Okay, so from this answer here, we know, I mean, and some of you did, I, I'm going to choose to do a while loop there. Some of you chose to do a for loop, um, which is totally acceptable because we know by the time we get to 10, we're way above a thousand. Okay, so we could be quite comfortable with a for loop and a break. Once I get to that condition, we'll break. I think this is more a natural while loop because you know um, that we got this condition we're going to meet. Uh, and as soon as we can assess this condition to be false or true, we can we will exit the while loop. Um, so we need to set it up a little differently. So while loops they're not going to increment naturally. We need to increment for it. It's not like going through a range of files. So we'll set our factorial answer to be zero to start off with. We'll set the count to be zero, right? And then we set our loop here while, and the condition that we want to be true for now is that factorial is less than or equal to 1,000. Okay. So once we start the loop, it will be as a, uh, the first time we go through because factorial answer was zero. We straight away increment our count. Um, so we add one to our count, so this is the first time we're through our loop. And then we do just like before, we say if the count was one, set the factorial answer, else when we set our factorial, we uh, changed x to count here, but it's the same. But we're assessing after this whether the factorial answer is above, is, well, we're saying it's below 1000, but as soon as this is false, we will exit the loop. Okay. So in this case, we go through, I think, seven times. And eventually it will tell us not the actual factorial answer, but it will tell us what was the count when this stopped being true. Okay, when the factorial answer was no longer less than or equal to a thousand, and that's the number we wanted to get. Okay. Using an set F else, um, create a factor from a vector one to 40, where all numbers less than 10 are small, 10 to 30 are mid, and 31 to 40 are big. So then we'd have to do this uh, nested if else. Right? So this is our following kind of the example we had. So first off, you just create the vector one to 40, great. Um, and then we're gonna do this if else. So we start with, I'll just type it out now. Let me make maybe this a bit bigger. Ooh. Um, how do I make my windows bigger? Usually that works for me. Oh, sorry. Um, command plus maybe. Ah. Okay. Um, so we have our cond x size one to forty, and then I'm saying anything less than ten is small. So I can do my if else. Um, else. And then I've got my condition. The first condition is going to be, is it less than 10? So cond exercise less than 10. Um, and if it was, I'm going to label it small. And then I had, if it's 10 to 30 mid, 31 to 40 big. So I would have to do another if else. Um, da, da, da. And then I would do uh, cond exercise 31 here. Um, and then if that's true, it's going to be mid. But if that's false, I can make it big. Is that going to work? Yeah, that's great. So just to give us an example of this nested if else kind of expression, and this really can be useful for building up your factors. Um, so this is the big 
question here, and this is the one you will do in later exercises. This is just one way of doing this. So I could see in the chat people are using L apply. There are many ways of doing this. It's just one example. So we have it somewhere that we can refer back to. Read in all the files from the expression directory with a dot text extension and create a table of gene expression results. Yeah, that's very open to interpretation. The thing we need to do first is get all the files in this directory, expression directory, expression results, and all the files ending with a dot text expression, uh, dot text. So we can do this here, files to read, dot results. The important thing here is if we want to get files with a dot text uh with a dot text in the name, we have to specify this pattern. We could actually, I mean, I think all the files were dot text. I think this is meant to be a dot and to be fair. Um, <clears throat> but with that, we can set the pattern and we can tell it we, we're just looking for these files. The other thing which is important here is full names equals true. If I got rid of this, it was just going to tell me the actual names of the files, but I need to know what directory it is so I can read it from there. So we'll do the full names is true and it tells me it's in the express run results and then it's here. Um, what we then do is I'm going to create an empty list and this is going to contain my results when we read them in. So at the moment it's all empty, but I've got a space for every file I know I'm going to read in because I know how many files I need to read in. Um, and then I can just loop through the length of the file. So the number of files I have, I can read them in and I can give uh, a read them in separator equals tab. They don't have a header apparently. Um, and then I'm going to set my own col names on them and I'm going to give them the first column gene names um, and then the second bit will be the name of the actual file. Uh, sorry um which which bit carolina uh which bit was that was it this one here uh no no sorry i can uh, is it okay if i use the microphone oh, yeah. yeah okay so in the when it says a uh, file read you create uh, you use the function vector mm -hmm. and yeah. then uh, you have the the list uh within um yeah that's true so I don't understand that fully. Shouldn't you, uh, yeah, use the a, a different function list or something? I don't know. The nice thing here is uh, you're right. I haven't. I, we haven't really gone into that. That's an example. So the alternative way to do this would be file uh, read like this, right? And you can create an empty list as well. Both things are going to give us the same result. Um, okay. When I when it's a vector here, I mean the vector is a. Ver in our vector is like the most basic data type and we're kind of building on top of that a list. So this is just one way of creating a list. Why I do this is because it allows me to set the length. Like, so up front, I already have, sorry, I already know that I'm going to fit 11. All right, right, you have a list of length, the number of uh, archives within your folder, right? Okay. But Thank I bet you, you um, and I'm, we can try this now. I bet you we can do this either way. So if I tried this like this, it works just the same, right? So I could do list there as well. Um, great, that's a good question, Calvin. So the next thing is base name. So I'm including some functions we haven't uh, really done, but if we don't know what a function does, what do we do? Question mark, name of the function. Base name removes all the path up to and including the last path separator, if any. Okay, so this is really useful because often our files are named things like the names of our samples. Oh, sheesh. Right. Oh, what am I doing? Files to read. So if we look at this, actually, this is the name of our sample, really, is not expression sample one. I don't want to call my columns expression results slash slash expression results sample one. So what I can do is apply this base name. Um, and actually here I'm just doing it to one at a time, but I can apply it to the whole vector. And it just chops off the path, right? So I no longer have the full path to the file, which I need for reading it, but I have the name of the file. So I'm going to use that then as my column headers. Um, 
So base name is going to give the everything after the actual name of the file in that directory. I can also do the reverse, which can be really useful. Uh, dir name. So files to root. So if I do dir name directory name, it gives me the directory um, therein here. So it's just you know, expression results. So you can use combinations of these to kind of isolate parts of the path in order to pull out, pull them out. In this case, it's quite common, like you name your files or a pipeline will name your file sample one expression. Um, and there we will use that. Here we can use base name or something. So I think then we read these in. We have our file read, this please do. Uh, Read in data. If we look at our list now, we should have <clears throat> two column lists, gene names, expression results, sample one. And um, you have the feeling that the annotation data really shouldn't have been read in. Uh, but then we can do the actual merging step of this now. So we have all our file read. So, you know, we have a list and every element in that list is a new sample and the expression results for it are going to get passed into the other ones. Yeah. Okay. So now we want to merge them all into one big table. What we're going to do, and I saw like lots of clever ways people were doing this, is we're going to basically loop through the list, merge them into a bigger data table. So to do that, first off, we're going to create an empty merge data. Don't necessarily need to do that. Okay, so we could then we're going to go loop through the length of the list. Um, so we're actually going to go through every element in the list for i in our list data frames. We're going to say is if is null. So if this is null, which it will be the first time we go through, I could have done you know if i in length these, and I would have just said if this is one. But here I'm saying if this is null. I set the first table we've read in to be the merge table. The second time, the second time I come through, I'm going to then go into uh, this loop because now merge table exists. It's no longer null. I set it to be the first data frame. And then I'm going to merge in the merge table from the previous loop with the new data frame as I come through the list. So I'm iterating through the list. Uh, first time through, I just set the first element of the list to the data frame. Second time through, I then merge the next element of the list with the data frame already created. And then I will just keep on merging until I've merged everything into this big data. Isn't the first row of them supposed to be removed? Perhaps um, file read one. Yes, so actually this is a, problem in our um, thing. This is meant to be called is this a problem with the exercise, I'm sorry. So if I rename this, this is meant to be called annotation.an. And so it's not meant to be read in in that first time through. That's my mistake. I didn't check this. I think it's been updated. So if I do that now, you go through, then we're good, right? Actually, then the next one is to read add annotation from annotation.txt. It should be annotation.add. Otherwise, it's already in our data frame. In this case, then, assuming that's the case, if I've saved that, I can then read in this annotation data, which deliberately was meant to be a bit different. I had to do header equals true here. So if I look here now, you know, it actually had column names. The ones up here didn't have column names. So these files, there's no column title. So it was meant to be a little, a little trick, but I think this file got renamed or maybe I renamed it last time. So anyway, we would read that in. We just need to change header to true. Um, and now we have all our expression data here. But we don't necessarily know anything interesting about the genes. We don't really know what they are. I just need to merge our annotation with that. I'm going to put the annotation first in the argument. So I get my annotation on the left of the table um, by one. I know that the first column is what I really need. I'm going to keep all the expression data 
but I'm going to throw away any annotation which only existed in this annotation table right, by doing all dot x equals false. And then I should just get my result there. Uh, yeah, so now I just have ensemble and I have some pathway. And then I can just find out, I think I just need to find out some additional information. I can do a summary of this, actually. Add the annotation, how do the pathways compare? Actually, this is a summary of this isn't particularly useful. Um, let's turn it into a factor. And then I can get something really useful from this. Okay. So now, now because it's a factor rather than a vector, when I run the summary, I actually get the numbers uh, in there. Okay, and we can see that in the original annotation, we seem to have lots of genes which were just missing any uh, pathway annotation. So we've thrown those all away at this point. Okay, so that's this exercise. I'm sorry, yeah, this should have been an annotation. And it would have worked and allowed you to merge it, but like someone pointed out, the annotation. And had a slightly different dot text, had a slightly different um, setup deliberately. It had a header, so you needed to read it a little differently. And uh, why was gene two all the way to gene nine skipped? Not quite sure. Um, oh, no, 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 sorry. They're not skipped. Um, they're reordered. I think they're still in the file. It's just reordered it. So, um, yeah, so I think if we look, presentation. Maybe we got tons, but you can see the order got changed a bit. So I think it's like alphanumeric order now rather than uh, thing. So gene one, gene two, if I go up, there's going to be a gene two somewhere. Let's check that fact. Yeah, so it's in there, it just got reordered. Um, so actually, that's also something we can control in the merge argument when we did that. So if we look at merge here, let's just do it afterwards. I'm going to get on to the next section. But if you look at merge, you can see um, sort equals true. So you can actually say sort equals false, and it will try and maintain the order as it originally went in in the first file. So in this case, they are there. It just got reordered. So you're going to see it. Uh, oh. Okay, so that's the end of that section. We're going to move now to our last section um, today, and that is where is it? Sorry, let me find it first. Um, and I'm going to have I restarted the recording. Yeah. Okay. And here we go. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is custom functions. And I'm going to say this is incredibly useful, obviously, to be able to write your own functions, because it means you're not writing long lists of code over and over again. You can write a function which, for instance, takes a directory path, finds all the files, reads them all in, merges them with maybe the annotation file. You can just supply you know, the two arguments you need there, the directory, the annotation file, it would zoom through and do all this rather than you having to write the same code over and over and over again. So functions are definitely a great idea. Um, but I will say we ran this course, I ran this course for the first two years, and I deliberately left out functions um, because we do not need them to do high throughput sequencing analysis and all this. The functions are already there, um, available for us. It's just not necessary. But really, to make this a complete course in R, we do need to discuss functions. So, you know, functions, as we've seen, allow you to perform a complex set of operations on um, the arguments which go to the function and to return one value back. Okay, so I can do the mean, D, 
give it a vector of numbers and it will return to me one number, which is the mean. Right? I can do print, sorry, paste, and it will return to me one value, often a vector of the pasted together uh, result. So we can create our own functions really easily in R using or following this structure. Right, so we have a name for our function here. We're going to call this one my first function. We're going to assign um, to this function. Right, so we're going to assign to this function name. We have our assignment, and we use the argue the actual function called function. Right, um, we put in bet between our uh, parentheses here any arguments that we want to pass to our function. And then we have our curly brackets either side of our block. And inside this block, it will take these arguments. It will run any operation which we code it to do. And finally, it's going to return here, return statement to pass this result back out of the function, you know, back into your R console. Okay, so this is how that looks like, you know, pseudo code set out here. I don't know why we're going to recapitulate the square function. So we can create functions and we can actually do this really easily in our studio. Let me show you. There's a function. And a message. I will come to that, Carolina. I will come to that. It's a big difference, actually. Um, uh, where was I going? Oh, yeah, our studio. So let's try this. So there's lots of shortcuts in our studio, and I'm not going to introduce you to them all. There is this wonderful page here, shortcuts from our studio, and you can make your life very smooth if you learn a few of these. Um, one wonderful trick in our studio is that if we write out something like this, um, blah, 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 sorry, y plus two plus one, um, x plus y. If we have a bit of code which we've been using just as we've been coding and creating, we can often just select this bit of code. I need to share a bit bigger of my screen, I think, to, to see now you see this. We can actually uh, select our code, come up to the R Studio thing here and select extract function, give it a name, uh, my And you can see it tries to build a little function for us. Okay, and it's done exactly what we just laid out there. It's um, got a name for our function. It asked me what the name was. It gave me the assignment. It's got the function argument, uh, function method function. The two arguments which it saw in my bit of code here, right? It's saying I want them. And then my code here. What I don't have though is this return argument, and we're going to come to this now. So this is, in fact, would be, you'd want to do this. So our studio makes this really easy for you to write functions out of code you've already created. You just select it and say extract function. But still, it's important to know how we put this together. So in our function here, we're going to create one now which sums two numbers. So we have to have some arguments, which will be the two numbers that we take as input from the user, and then we do this sum on. So here we have um, a function, and we give it num1, num2. These names we provide here will also be these argument names you would see when you do question mark help. Right, so there are argument names here. These names are also used in the function, and then here we can go num1 plus num2, so it takes whatever values were there puts them into a sum num and then returns this. Right, so return passes back from your function to the R console, right? From the internals of the function, you pass in your arguments. It then assigns back to here, my result, the returned value. So you can only return one object which actually seems like it's going to be really troublesome when you start learning programming. You can only return one thing. Um, so here we're just going to do a multiply two numbers. And we're going to add the two numbers. We're going to times them. And if I try and add two things to my return statement, some num, multiple num, 
it just tells you multi-argument returns are not permitted. Okay. Some languages they are, actually Python will allow you to return multiple and assign them to multiple things at the same time, but not in R. But we can get around this really easily. There's a solution to this, obviously. Um, and one thing is we don't necessarily return them as two separate things. We return the information as one object. So we can return, in this case, the both numbers, we could return a vector containing these two numbers. So we just expand our function a bit, it takes num1, num2 still, we get the plus, we then do the times together. We then make a vector of results in order to return. Okay, so some num, multiple num, right? I'm gonna concatenate them together, combine them, sorry, uh, into a vector, and then gonna give it names so that when the user gets them back from the return statement here, they're actually names, so he knows which one's which. That's multiple, that's sum. Is that right? That's the wrong way around, look. Sorry, that's the, that's the wrong way around. Um, yeah, but you know, the, the spirit was that we would give them the right names and then pass it back. Okay. Lists here start to become very useful. Okay, so lists are your, as I said, hold all kind of objects, right? We can put data frames into a list. We can put other lists into a list. We can put factors into a list, vectors into a list. A list can hold pretty much any data type. So lists are often what we'll use when we have a nice complex function and we want to return multiple results from it. Often we'll just put this into a list and we'll name the elements in our returned object by something useful. So here it's input and I just give it back the input numbers and then the result, I'm gonna give it back the data frames. Okay, so I'm gonna again, just run my first fun, give it the values for the arguments here, num1, num1, num2, num2, goes off, does this, creates our list and then returns this um, out of the function to the user here. Okay, so then the return statement is the end of the function, right? So anything which is happening up until that return statement may run, anything after that return statement, this is one big difference from message. Message would just, as you can see, continue. Return takes this value, passes it back out of the function, and then it ends. So there's no more processing happens after that. As soon as the return message is done, that's the end of the function returning it back to the console. So in this case, we can really illustrate that by putting a message before the return, before return, putting one after, running our function. And you can see we got the message for before return, but anything after that didn't come back. So this return statement, you know, here is explicitly saying this is the object, this is the in this case, list that we return as the result of my function call. I don't think it's great practice, but you don't actually need a return statement for a function to work and be valid. By default, when you write these functions, the last thing which happens in the function is returned out of the um, out of, out of the function back to the console. So in this case, I don't need to actually put explicitly return around list to return. I just put it as the last object in the um, function and it just returns this back out of the console. This is done quite a lot. Maybe people just think it's kind of, there's a nice style to it, but I, I like this before explicitly stating what you're returning seems like a much better idea, but the results will be exactly the same. This is just the last thing listed in your function. That is what's treated as the returned object. So then we start to get into something called variable scope. Okay, so it's kind of a world within your function. So as your function's happening, you know, there's variables being created and used. And there's a world outside your function, which we call the global environment. Then we can call the, the, the uh, function environment is everything in here. 
So in this case, um, just to really demonstrate this, we have our function. We have num1, num2, these are our arguments. In the side of the function, we create transiently this um, new object called sum num. And it's sum num then that we return out. So if I then run the function, num equals two, num two equals three, I give it back uh, my result. I can see I got the number, right? So I must have calculated sum num internally, but sum num does not exist outside of my function, right? So if I you know, demo demonstrate this maybe. <laughs> So um, if I type in sum num, it doesn't exist. I run this function, get my result, but sum num still doesn't exist. And this is because the this concept of scope. Anything created inside here only affects inside there, right? These only exist within the environment of the function. So if long I could work more with some num inside my function, I can add three to it or something. So it's always available to me inside, but no matter, it's always my result now, it's a bit different, but still I don't have sum num. It transiently exists in the scope of it, it only exists inside that function. Mm -hmm. Global um, variables, though, which you define outside your function, are available for those inside your function. And I'd say this is bad practice. Um, but in this case here, I can do my first function, and I give it two numbers. And these are the ones we would normally add together. And then I add a third number, which I don't supply in the arguments, but I have already defined in the global in the global environment. So in the actual outside the function, R will go and take num one, num two, and then it will take this value from the global environment, and then it will return. So it's not going to break because it can still find this from the global environment. But as you can imagine, this isn't great practice, right? Because I could I've got my function which seems self-contained. I give it these numbers, but it's affected by something which is outside my function. And maybe I change that value earlier on in the day. I try and run my function. My function gives a different result to before I change this number. So functions should be self-contained, but variables in the global environment are available to them. Uh, yeah, so, but now it starts to get kind of interesting. If I have a global a number, a variable in my global environment, and here I'm going to do num1 plus num2 plus this variable from my global environment, I'm actually going to set to a variable the same name. And I'm then going to return. This variable here is protected from being changed from inside the function. So this my third number here, when I return it, um, it gets nine there, but if I then just type in my third number again in the global environment, it's actually referencing this version here. So things like I can reference the same uh, variables inside the function and set to them, but actually I'm not changing the one in the global environment. And again, that's really useful because I wouldn't want to change this from something internally happening inside my function. But also, I might not be the person writing this function. Someone else may have given it to me. Um, and I wouldn't want consequences if some gay person gave you a function and is changing variables in your global environment. Um, that's, a, that's really a side effect, and that, that shouldn't be a, a way of writing this. You may want to, and actually, this would come in more. I have seen this used more in uh, setting more complex global variables, but also in some of the interactive, shiny, R stuff. Sometimes you do want to actually affect the variable outside. For whatever reason, you do want to change this number. You can do that by using a special type of assignment. And it's actually this double pointer, effectively. 
So here, rather than just doing a single pointer like here, I'm now going to put a double pointer, point it to my third number. Um, and now when I run this result, not only does this change to be nine, because I've done this double, it's also going to change this. Can I, I wouldn't, I, I struggle to think of examples where this is really something you want to do outside of really complex uh, defining your global environment or, or in some of the interactive tools. I, I know we do it there. So by default or so far when we've had these functions, um, we haven't had any default arguments, right? So the user has to supply a num1 and a num2 every time they run this function. Quite often, um, there are sensible defaults you want to give your function. You know, like say the DIR function, which we're using, first place it looks by default will be the work, present working directory. Um, so sometimes we do want to supply default arguments so that the user doesn't necessarily need to specify them and it will just run with these default arguments if you don't set any arguments yourself. So we can do that easily in our argument setup here, our function setup, by setting in our function call num1 and I'm going to set it to be one by default and num2 are set to be three by default. Now, when I call this function, if I don't give it any arguments, it's going to use these default arguments. Num1 will be one, num2 will be three. So it's going to add them together with this third number from my global environment and then return that to me. If I want to overwrite that though, I want to use different variables, uh, different numbers for my arguments. I can of course supply them myself. Right, this is just the default. If no one, if you don't supply anything like here, by default it will use one. So I mean, this is really where the most use comes of it. You don't necessarily want to write these tiny short functions. Why would you? But when you have a complex operation, and maybe a complex operation specific to you then you want to put maybe hundreds of lines of code inside your function and just supply it with a couple of arguments. It does all the work internally and just gives you back the summarized result. So here we've got one, which is, uh, I think Matt's example, where we're doing a Z scores. So to do that, we're going to take um, the numbers, my number and a vector. And we'll take the mean of the vector, gives you then a message to say what the mean is then going to do the difference of your number versus the mean gets the standard deviation of our of our vector and then it can use that to then normalize the difference from the mean by the standard deviation and return this back okay. and this return statement then passes back just the z score to the user okay you're going to just reiterate message is all just about message print cat these are all functions which just print to the screen. Nothing is returned in R, right? So if I, when I message something, it goes to the console, it's not sent to an object. The return is sending the object back from the function to a variable, okay? So we can actually assign it to something. We can't do this with message. So A, so here we're just taking our norm. I'm not sure if we've seen this, but our norm just gives you a normal distribution of values around this, 20. Um, and then we can run my Z score, give it the one number I want to compare to the rest of my vector and give my Z score for it. Okay. Just an example of a more complex function. You will occasionally <clears throat> get into situations where you just need to start to um, work out what is going wrong in these functions. Okay. So I'm going to show this actually in our studio. Um, can I get a question? Hang on. Green. So you're writing these complex functions. And then I run it. Most of the time, it's going to work first time with our functions. But maybe I've changed something or it becomes more complex um, and it no longer works. Damn. 
this is probably quite obvious, it's a short function, but if I want to start to evaluate what is going wrong inside my function, I can actually run this uh, little method here, debug. I give it my function name, my first function. Okay, so now I'm in debug mode for this function. If I run that function again, it's gonna run it slightly differently. First thing is it opens up the function up top. So it's gonna try and show me where I am in my function. And I can then press enter and it's doing now the first line of my function. And I can actually see the results as I go. So I'm not sure if I've done it yet. And some, num, nope, I haven't done it yet. No. So it's gonna run this line, some num is num plus two. I press enter, it's run it now. I can see some num is temporarily available to me here. Okay, so that worked in the function. And then I look at the next line and I try that. Okay, and it was that line then which broke. Okay, so it just allows me to go one line at a time through our functions, see up until the point I break, and then I can go, okay, it was that line which broke. I would go back to my function. Um, <clears throat> and then see if I can fix this. So again, it just tells me I'm debugging. First line's run, okay, I've got the value there. Next line, break, that was the problem. Problem is now is every time I run this function, it's gonna keep on going into debug mode. If I wanna turn that off, I can just go undebug my first function. Now, if I run it, it's just gonna break, but no debug. That can be really useful, not just with your own functions, but other people's functions as well. So sometimes I'm back in the R Studio. Sorry. Sometimes you get these very complex functions off packages, uh, high throughput sequencing, and you want to know why it's breaking. You can either email these people, Google, but actually stepping through the line at a time inside their function and saying, oh, it breaks at this line. It can sometimes make it very clear. Obviously, just to just to finish that off. Obviously, now you have things like your own functions. You can start to use these in combinations with things like L apply, S apply, apply. It's all going to work just as if um, you know it was an inbuilt function in R. Once you've created this function, you run that command. It's available to you in your current R session, and you can just use it as we did other functions with S apply, L apply, apply. Okay, so I think we have a few slides now on just getting some additional libraries. Um, so libraries can be loaded into R, and we've seen this with this library argument. And actually, I think I showed this in my first slides. I mean, R Studio makes this really easy for you as well. Um, I'm going to share my desktop rather than to continually move between sharing screens. Um, so here we have this packages pane. And this shows us all the packages we have. I think if I just type library, it gives me a list of all the packages I have here. So it's very similar. What is in here is basically what is in here, except I get the version information here as well. Okay, and then, you know, obviously we saw if I want to load a library, I can do library, and then I just give it the library I want to load. An alternative to library is require. Um, the reasons why we might want to use one over the other, both good. If we need to install new um, packages, we can use the R Studio way of doing this, or we could just do this RAN way, the, the console way of doing it, install.packages hmiss. In this case, you've got top tools, install packages, you can choose your repository. It can be local or CRAN here. And then I think if I start typing, it fills in. So it's obviously scanning CRAN. It knows what's available. And it's going to fill that in for you, which is probably easier. And it's going to install it dependencies as well. So we don't need to worry. This library needs this other code to work. It's all going to get it for you. That is the same as doing this. And then we'll go off and install oh well, that's clever look at that it even tells me i've spelt it wrong 
So that's going to go to CRAN. It's going to download HMIS. I think I already have that installed. So I already have the dependencies. But if I had more dependencies required, it would go get all the dependencies too. Um, scripts. So I think the last things we're going to talk about is a little bit of how you might save the work we're doing as scripts or workspaces, workspaces, and how we can run these outside of our. So in our studio, once I've done my bit of work here and I've got my code and I want to save this, I can go file, save as, and I just save it as a desktop. And it's going to save it as temp.r. And then when I want to open this again, our studio is going to recognize this, um, this data. The other thing I might want to save isn't just this code, but I might want to save some of these objects. If I have spent hours uh, processing data, and we're not just talking writing the code and working out what I'm going to do, but the computer's taken hours to process it, I need to save that to save me time so I'm not running eight hours worth of processing every day. I can save. Um, I can save any of these objects or the entire workspace using either from here session save workspace as right, my desktop. Um, and that's going to go save dot image and it's going to save that here. I can also save individual um, parts of my workspace, my objects, just with save. And now I could give it um, you know, an object I want to save. What have I got? Um, a little bit of my result, maybe. Right. And then I'm going to get a file in my here on the desktop, which is called my workspace. If I wanted to, I could then load that in and it will just load in this object, my result back into my workspace. Again. So, you know, this means that I can save, save image is saving everything in your workspace. Save, I'm saving a particular object. And then if I went into a new R, uh, you know, loaded up my computer again tomorrow, should be able to load that. And I think I haven't got anything in my environment now, but if I go let's desktop um, my workspace data, once I've loaded that, you can see my results is now available to me in my environment. And in fact, if I type it, it's, it's, it's as if I was working in the other session. So I can save all the work I've done, not just the script, but the actual objects and results using save image and save. R scripts, so like self-contained R script, um, you know, allow us to re save, reuse custom functions we have written. Uh, to run code from an R script, we just need to use this source function um, with the name of the R script as the argument. So in this case, I've got a script here. Oop, I changed my files. Change my working directory. Oh, I did, didn't I? Uh, more go to working directory. Brilliant. And then I had scripts, and I have this script day of the week. Okay, so in here, I've got one function. And like I was saying, you, you know, we've just seen that you can write your own functions. I would save them in a script, but if I want to make use of them, do I need to copy and paste them every single time? No, actually, I can just do this source. And I can say uh, scripts uh, day of the week. And as soon as I do that, it just loads all the R from that function. It's going to run it and then give me all the uh, all these available to me. I can also just press source here, and it's going to source the entire script as well. So it's just running this entire script. And that means that I get all these functions as well. Does this work? This function day of the week. It's Friday. Great. Okay, last few things. So right now we are running R interactively. You can, perhaps this is more outside the scope of this particular course, but you can run R non-interactively through either R command batch, and then the name of the script you want to run, or R script, 
and then you can give it the name of the script. Vanilla here tells it you know, to, to use the most plain version of R. Don't bother saving or restoring workspaces. It just runs basic R. So I think we can actually see that. We have a little terminal here. I think if I type R, it's going to open up R within that. But if I write R script, this is our um, way of running a file non interactively, and you know, it's not going to do anything, but I could run. Where am I? R script scripts. LS. But you could run our script and give it the name of a file. So I'm going to copy the name of the file here. Nope. 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 Uh, open show folder new terminal. Copy. Hey Siri, can you open a terminal? And then, sorry, I just have to give it the full path to our script. So it runs it. This script isn't doing anything, but it's going to run it. You can actually, maybe I could add something to the script. Print hello. Is that now? So this is just a way of rather than opening up R, running the scripts interactively. If I have my script and I've written it that it's going to read in the file, it's all set up already. I can just use this R script command in my terminal over here or in your you know, terminal of choice. R script, the path to the file I want to run. Sometimes you're going to want to give this arguments. Um, in order to give arguments to our script, we need to add just a few lines to our script. Um, and in this case, we're going to add these two lines. So it would be args, command args equals true. Tell it our args one is our first argument. And this just means that when we run our script, we can give it additional arguments after the name of the file. And they get read into R and they get put in this args vector. What's kind of annoying, and this is common across most languages, is when you read in anything from the arguments using this R script, it's always going to be a character. It's always going to turn this into a character. So if you try and take an argument from the command line and sum it, it's always going to, it's not going to work. It's always going to fail. So we just need to do as.numeric, and then we can turn it into something we can start to use for numeric operations. So these last few slides, very briefly, really anything we're doing, you can make an R script and run it from this other way of running it. So that's it in terms of the day. We have some exercises here. They are hopefully quite simple. Um, but we're going to leave you to run through this now. I'm going to be back at 4.30 to make a quick run through of these uh, questions. And I will do a recording as well. So I think the recording would already be there, but I will make a recording. We'll try and add that by next week. Um, so if you need to go now, um, don't want to hang around for the 4.30 exercise run through, feel free to go. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to leave you to it. I'll be back at 4.30. And for those of you who are going, have a great weekend. Um, for those of you who aren't, I will see you back here.
Um, so here's the solutions, and we can try and implement them on the slide here. This will be fun. I don't think I've ever done these exercises before. I think this is a map that these ones together. Um, create a function which takes one number and returns the square of that number. So here is our function. Let's just copy and paste and see what it does. Um, okay, we'll open up our console here. So square number, we need a function. Um, so we can define any function using this function. Um, setting uh, my fun. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, we named it square of number. We have the function. It's going to take an argument, create a function which takes one number. So it's going to have one argument. And we're calling it number. Um, and then we just need to make the square of that number. So we're going to do that number to the power of two. Put it to a square number, and then we're going to do return square number. So we can see that in action. Nine, uh, 100, and then if you put in a character, it's just going to die. Okay, we can try something while we're here as well. We can do this taking a rid of the return and seeing if that still works. It makes no difference. We don't need the return. It's good practice to have a return there. Data function which takes two numbers. Okay, so mean of numbers. Um, I think the only difference here is we need to have two arguments. So we have number, comma, number two. Right, so these would be our two numbers, and it's going to return the mean. So to do that, very easy. I just take number one, number two, I create a vector. Um, both numbers. So I create a vector, and then from that vector, I can just take the mean of it. I have the mean of no numbres, and I return that in my last. Okay. This is a little bit of a trick question here. I wonder if anyone fell for this. Um, take a function which create which takes two vectors and returns the mean. All right, I've already got it. I think All right. this is going to work for vectors too. Um, does it? Number one, C number one, mean of. Oh, I got to rerun this. We should be good. Uh, mean of numbers. Because uh, two is in the middle, so maybe that's why it's confusing me. If I do that. That's better. Okay. So actually, this is a really nice feature of R. We don't need to say what type of uh, argument or what type of uh, object this is, right? As long as it is accepted by the mean function, then it would be fine. So here we could have a single number, but if I gave it a numeric vector, it's fine. I can concatenate the two numeric vectors together and take a mean. So actually this function here and this function here were exactly the same. Create a function which takes two numbers and returns the two numbers as a vector and the mean summary and multiple as a data. So I guess this is really a test in that, you know, how are you going to return that? It's not going to be easy. It's going to be multiple things we need to return. We can't return multiple things out of an R function. So, you know, if I try to do this, and I'm just returning the input and the DF, um, Going to give me an error and it'll say exactly the error we saw earlier on. Multi argument returns are not permitted. It sucks. Um, but it's easy to solve, right? All we need to do is turn our returned object into a list. In fact, I'll do it outside of here. Okay, so I'm going to return a list. So my list. I want to give them a name. I didn't give them a name here. Um, so let me give them a name, input, and result. And then they were pretty easy. I took the two numbers. I concatenate them to create a vector, which I'll return. I make a data frame, and that contains the mean of the numbers, the sum of the numbers, and then the times of the numbers. And these columns are going to be called mean, sum, multiple. 
Um, and the very end, I need to return here my list. See if I can get something out. So now that, that should work. Okay. Actually, in cases like this, you can start to see why sometimes it might be nice just to return the last line, right? That looks a little prettier, maybe. Then rather than having to set the list to something and return it, or even wrapping that in return, maybe that's a little uh, less lines of code. Create a function that takes one argument, finds the smallest number whose factorial is greater than that argument. So this is an exact copy of the questions we had earlier. So if I went and took our solution for our earlier, earlier set of um, exercises, so I think it's in here, oh, here it is, this factorial answer question. So I could take that So that is my, uh, to find the first number which had a factorial greater than um, a thousand, right? So now I just need to be able to replace this argument of a thousand, right? That's the only thing I need to change. It's greater than that argument. Okay. So our exercise earlier on had a thousand hard coded, so now we'll call it uh, my greater than this, or greater, great than this, greater than this. And then I just wrap it in a function. So it's gonna take just that argument and then put the rest of this in a quote, you know, curly brackets, curly brackets. Okay, and then I need to give it a name. I'm gonna call it, call it what Matt called it. Find smallest factorial. Okay, so I've just taken my bit of code we had earlier, um, which was hard coded to find the first factorial, first number whose factorial was greater than a thousand. I just replace a thousand with an argument, which I can then allow to be passed to this function. And then that should be all I need to do. And smallest. Uh, uh, oh, and great. Notice here again, I haven't put the return in. We should do, right? Because count was the last thing in the function. So it was going to return that by default. I can say return now, and it will be uh, explicitly. Okay. Uh, add an if else statement in your function to calculate factorial code only calculate factorial code if it is known. So we can, this is a great, great one by Matt actually, because you know, this is a writing now a little bit of a robust function. Okay, we'll do some checks on what actually the user is passing in. So we could do if uh, is dot numeric, and we'll take the argument greater than this here. I'm going to say if it's not Eric, um, and then we'll do a stop. Okay. And I'll do something like arguments. So in the solution here, what Matt's done is he's giving you an if else. Actually, that's probably closer to what we've really covered in class. I can do an if else, month this line out. Um, and I can wrap that. So in this case, and I'll turn this now into a message. Okay, so in this case, you'll run this function greater than this. First, it will be checked by this function is.numeric. 
Um, and if you Google like how to check something as a numeric, you would have come up with this. You also do question mark and just see what it does. So it's actually in the same kind of families as this as dot numeric we saw earlier on in the uh, classes as dot character as dot vector. But now we have is dot numeric and it will check is this actually numeric and we could do is dot character is it a character. Um, but in this case, it's important to check that it's uh, numeric because otherwise we're not going to be able to do any of this. So what Matt set up would, if this is not uh, numeric, just print the message and it will just skip the rest, right? There's nothing else for it to do. The rest of this is an else statement. If it is numeric, this is false. It will go to the else and it will actually evaluate the result. So it will run this part and return the result. There is no return here. Um, what I did there actually was a little different as I did a didn't have that second else. And I had it if and then I said stop. So stop is a little like break, but for functions. If we go here, stop execution of the current expression and executes an error action. And you can see it, you know, actually if stop, which is pretty much what we've just done here. And effectively, if I run this now, let's try and see if this works. factorial, uh, 10, uh, 100, it's great. You know, if I do on error in find smallest factorial, um, so it gives me the error and what's nice here, it gives me my custom error argument, which is what I put here in the stop. Okay, so stops a little bit more um, hard than just skipping it, but it's going to give us this error, which is what we want, right? This isn't something which is going to work. It gives us the error and I get the argument, uh, the actual message I put after the stop there. Okay, chat. What if we don't put the word between, um, you mean like this? Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. So what happens if we do this? Is that right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So it's gonna go, um, it's trying to look, and it, you know, this will look for an object called Tom. Right? It's gonna think um, anything which isn't in quotes, it's gonna think is a variable. The only exception to that, actually, there is some exceptions to that, um, which we will come across or later on in the class, and that's um, tidyverse. So tidyverse will accept unquoted uh, variables as, as characters. Okay, but in this case, you're exactly right in what you said. Um, <laughs> if you just put there, it's going to go and say, "Okay, you're trying to pass me an object called Tom." And it will just Okay, so I think we've come to the end of our class today. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to stop. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, stop the share and I'll say goodbye. Um, I'll